This is a Glass 1004, the first mass-produced car ever to use a rubber timing belt to drive the camshafts of its engine. It was made back in 1962 by a German company called Hans Glass. Believe it or not, this car is actually the great-grandfather of the BMW 3 Series. Because when BMW acquired Hans Glass back in 68, they were inspired by their sporty, compact executive cars, and then they designed their O2 series based on the same philosophy, approach, and overall parameters and proportions. The O2 series then led to the E21 3 series, and the rest is history. But what's probably more important about the glass car is that it demonstrated the benefits of a rubber timing belt to other car manufacturers. Rubber timing belts, they run quieter than chains because, well, they're made from rubber and chains are all clickety clankety metal, so they produce some noise. Rubber timing belts also absorb engine vibrations, some engine vibrations, and even engine harmonics, so they reduce the harshness. They allow a more compact engine design, and they're also lighter, easier to move around, which means that they reduce parasitic losses during engine operation. They do need to be replaced compared to chains more frequently, but at least it's much easier and cheaper to replace a timing belt than a timing chain. And so manufacturers saw all of these benefits, a rubber timing belt started spreading, and by the late 60s, mid 70s, they were pretty much mainstream and could be found in different engines of many different cars of many different manufacturers. Something else that's very important about rubber timing belts that was beaten into the heads of mechanics, DIYers, and consumers when belts started to become mainstream is that rubber timing belts and engine oil do not mix. Exposing a rubber timing belt to a significant quantity of engine oil is going to cause the belt to swell up, to crack, to delaminate, which is going to cause it to fail. When the belt snaps or fails, we are going to lose synchronization between the crankshaft and the camshafts, and on an interference engine, this is going to result in the piston hitting the valves, bending the valves, leading to a loss of compression and requiring a very expensive engine rebuild. So it was very surprising Back in 2007, when Ford released an engine where the timing, rubber timing belt, was exposed to engine oil all the time. Heck, it wasn't even exposed. Part of it was actually submerged in engine oil all the time. The engine in question is the Ford 1.8 TDCI turbo diesel inline four engine. Before 2007, this engine had a timing chain running from the crankshaft to the high pressure diesel injection pump, and then a dry rubber timing belt running from the fuel pump to the camshaft. After 2007, late 2007, the timing chain was replaced with a rubber timing belt, which was now exposed to the oil in the same way that the timing chain was. What's even more interesting is that Ford extended the service interval of the wet oil exposed belt compared to the dry belt. The dry belt, as before, was given 160,000 kilometers or five years, whereas the wet belt in oil was given 200,000 kilometers or 10 years before it needed replacing. According to Ford, the lower belt, the wet belt, benefited from lubrication by the engine oil, and so it had a longer service life. So something that was a contaminant for 40 years was now called a lubricant. Unsurprisingly, many members of, of the general public, as well as mechanics, uh, engineers, DIYers, pretty much anyone with a dash of common sense and basic chemistry understanding, thought that this was a bad idea. But Ford knew better, because according to them, great effort was put into making the system reliable. The belts were made from a special rubber compound, HNBR, hydrogenated nitrile butadiene rubber, which was then coated with PTFE. We have high strength fibers inside the belt and nylon on the teeth of the belt. The benefits of the wet belt, in addition to the increased service life, is that they further reduce noise compared to dry belts because the oil in there helps to reduce or eliminate any remaining noise from the belt, which you could never hear in the first place because the engine has cams and valves and it's all metal and there's 
combustion, but apparently it's a benefit. But the main cited benefit of wet belts is that the oil in there helps to reduce the friction between the teeth of the belt and the cam gears, which leads to a claimed fuel consumption reduction of 1%. In 2012, it became obvious that Ford considered their wet belt technology a success and a good idea because they introduced it in the brand new 1-liter 3-cylinder turbocharged petrol uh, EcoBoost engine, which soon spread to many models in Ford's fleet. Other manufacturers also considered Ford's technology a good idea and a success because they too started introducing it on their models very soon after Ford. Renault was one of the earliest adopters in their 1.5 DCI diesel engines. In 2010, Volkswagen followed along with their 1.5 TSI turbo petrol uh, together with Vauxhall and Al Alpol in their 1.2 and 1.5 turbocharged petrol engines. And in 2013, Peugeot joined the party with their 1.2 PureTech 3 cylinder turbocharged petrol engines. But today, in 2024, we have more than enough data and reports to say with great certainty that wet belts are not a good idea and not a success. Just like many engineers, journalists, mechanics, and other members of the general public with a dash of common sense and basic understanding of chemistry and physics claimed when the technology was first introduced. Wet belt technology has caused thousands upon thousands of premature belt failures, leading to catastrophic engine failure, costing owners thousands upon thousands of euros. Even when belt deterioration was caught on time before the belt actually snapped, a premature belt replacement still costs anywhere between 500 to more than 1,000 euros depending on where you live and your vehicle make and model. The vast majority of wet belts never made it anywhere near the recommended service interval, which is between 200 and 240,000 kilometers, depending on the manufacturer and the model of the vehicle. Most required replacement at half that, which is around 100,000 kilometers, which is less than an equivalent dry belt. And there are numerous reports of wet belts actually failing before the vehicle ever reached 100,000 kilometers. But wait, we are forgetting the 1% fuel savings. Maybe those savings can offset all of these additional costs? Well, let's put it into perspective. Let's crunch the numbers. The average European covers 13,000 kilometers uh, with their car every year. If we take an average fuel consumption of 6.5 liters per 100 kilometers, this gives us a total annual fuel amount of 845 liters. If the average price of fuel is 1.8 euros per liter, this gives us a total annual cost of fuel per consumer of 1,521 euros. 1% 1 of that is 15.2 euros. 15.2 euros. That's how much a wet belt saves the consumer per year. 15.2 euros in exchange for the financial and environmental burden of thousands upon thousands of prematurely failed engines and, as we know, recycling busted engines and manufacturing new engine parts creates significant pollution and emissions. In some cases, entire vehicles had to be scrapped because the cost of the engine rebuilt was actually greater than the cost of the entire vehicle, a vehicle which could have otherwise covered many more kilometers. So why do wet belts fail? Well, they fail because special rubber compounds and coatings do not make the belt permanently and completely resistant to oil, heat, and sludge. Using the incorrect grade and specification of the oil greatly speeds up belt deterioration. But even with the correct grade of oil, it is very, very hard to make a wet belt reliably and consistently capable of reaching 240,000 kilometers. This could be reliably achieved if the engine had an oil change interval of somewhere around 5,000 kilometers. But nobody's going to buy a car with an oil change interval of 5,000 kilometers nowadays. So manufacturers recommend 15 to 20,000 kilometer oil change intervals, the same as for engines with dry belts and chains. Wet belts have been arguably the most failure prone on small three cylinder turbocharged petrol engines. And that's because these engines are kind of stupid by their design. They achieve north of 100 horsepower with minimal displacement. Of course, to get so much with so little, we need to run a lot of boost pressure with the turbocharger. The more boost we run, the hotter the engine runs. 
When we combine an engine that naturally tends to run hot with stop and go traffic in the city, and then even in summer, and temperatures can get very, very dangerous very quickly, which makes the engine susceptible to knock. When the ECU or the engine control unit detects even tiny traces of knock, it is going to inject more fuel to make the engine run richer and it is going to retard ignition timing. These two things will help cool down the engine. But the longer the engine runs rich, the faster the quality of the oil deteriorates. The worse the condition of the oil, the faster the wet belt is going to fail. So, hot little rich running petrol engines are the worst candidates for wet belts. But it is precisely these engines that receive them. To make matters worse, a wet belt doesn't even need to fail to cause significant engine damage or even failure. And that's because as the belt deteriorates, tiny little chunks, little pieces of rubber start to separate from the belt, they circulate through the oil, and eventually they start gathering at the strainer of the oil pump pickup. When enough uh, particles accumulate, they block off most of the pickup, which leads to oil pressure loss, which of course leads to accelerated engine wear, which usually starts at the cylinder head and proceeds to the rest of the engine if left unresolved. A simple oil change will not remove the accumulated belt particles from the strainer. Instead, the engine sump and associated components must be removed and the strainer cleaned manually. If a low oil pressure scenario due to a blocked strainer has occurred, then it is very likely that components such as the oil pump or the vacuum pump and variable valve timing actuators need to be replaced as well. None of these items are cheap. Now here's the worst part. Everything I have told you in this video is common knowledge about materials, engines, and belts, information that has been readily available to anyone for the past 50 years. There has been no recent major technological advancement and breakthrough in rubber manufacturing or, com or compounds or anything that has made rubber timing belts good candidates for continued reliable exposure to hot engine oil. On top of this, there have been many previous examples of rubber parts, parts made fully from rubber, performing poorly when continuously exposed to hot engine oil. A, one of the more recent examples is engines, I believe two-liter diesels used in Opel Insignias, some Alfa Romeos. Uh, there have been engines with similar technology in Audis and Volkswagens as well. And these engines involved a rubber O-ring. So a O-ring made entirely from rubber between the oil pump and the oil pump pickup. Over time, this rubber O-ring deteriorates, it becomes brittle, it loses its flexibility, which leads to oil pressure loss, which again leads to accelerated engine wear or failure if left unresolved. There is no benefit to using a rubber O-ring between the oil and oil pump and the oil pump pickup when compared to a traditional metal-based gasket, which has been successfully used in thousands of different engines for decades. This would have been a very nice lesson of how rubber performs in hot engine oil. And this is a static item. A rubber O-ring doesn't move. Now think of a belt. Imagine what it has to go through, all the tension forces, all the torque from the engine, while it's at the same time trying to, to resist hot contaminated engine oil. What I'm trying to say is that there is absolutely no way that manufacturers were not fully informed and fully aware of the consequences and of the fact that there is virtually no chance of wet belts reliably lasting the recommended service interval. I believe there is no chance that there hasn't been a meeting or at least, you know, some conversation or probably a series of meetings where somebody raised their hand and said, hey, based on this very basic science and precedence in the auto industry, this is not a good idea. I'm also pretty sure that somebody was either silenced or outvoted by people who had different motives.
When the first cases of wet belts failing started popping up everywhere, manufacturers did nothing to discontinue this technology and replace it with other readily available proven technology. Instead, they recommended more frequent belt inspection and shorter service intervals for vehicles used in quote-unquote severe driving conditions. Frequent short trips and stop-and-go traffic were cited as examples of severe driving conditions. Conditions which are basically unavoidable for pretty much anyone owning a car today. To mitigate problems with wet belts, manufacturers invested into this highly advanced tool. It's a basically a little piece of metal which you put on the belt. And if the belt doesn't fit between the two little legs, then you have to replace the belt. And that's because a wet belt can swell up and require replacement even if there are absolutely no visible signs of deterioration such as delamination or cracking. Recently, some manufacturers and some of their models have started replacing wet belts with dry belts and chains, and there's a lot of industry speculation and rumors that in the near future, the remaining models and manufacturers are going to abandon wet belts in favor of more conventional proven technology. But, but this is happening only after a very, very significant number of failures, after a very significant amount of bad rep and negative publicity and after a significant accumulated potential for lawsuits. The fact remains that over the past 15 years, wet belts have generated a very significant steady stream of income for manufacturers due to the increased demand for parts. Another interesting fact remains, and that is that none of the Japanese manufacturers put wet belts into any of their engines. Uh, there's an exception here. Interestingly enough, Honda, with their 1.6 liter ID Tech diesel engine, as found in the ninth and tenth generation of the Civic in Europe. But other than that, nothing, zero wet belts. My point is that stuff like this, and I'm sure there's many examples like this in many other industries, makes me kind of frustrated and disillusioned with humanity. <laughs> I know this is going to sound weird coming from wet belts to conclusions about humanity, but hear me out. Stuff like this makes it really painfully obvious that our technology has advanced so much more than us. But us humans are still the masters of technology. So what happens sometimes is that instead of using technology to solve problems, we use technology to make problems with the goal of profit. And when you think about it, we have advanced so much away, so much further than we were in the Middle Ages. But very large parts of the world are still facing Middle Ages problems, famine, disease, uh, poor or no access to healthcare, education, other basic needs, you name it, Middle Ages problems. And, and I, I'm not a fan of communism, I'm not a fan of capitalism, I'm not a fan of ideologies and labels or any of that. I'm a fan of objectivity and rationality. And I think that manufacturers should not be allowed to produce garbage technology and then greenwash it with a 1% fuel saving and then keep producing that same garbage technology for 15 years, even though there have been numerous examples of failures of that technology clearly visible in the public space. So yeah, that's pretty much it for today. I, I, I don't like ending videos like this on a slightly depressing note, but this, I think it's important to do, to do this and talk about this. And I think as many people as possible should talk, to talk about this because the more we talk about it, the more people are aware of it, the more it's present out there, the, 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 the smaller, hopefully, the smaller the chances of this happening again in the future. And I'm sure that if there wasn't a you know, all the bad publicity that manufacturers will probably continue making wet belts for the next 15 years. Who knows? Uh, so yeah, that's it. If, if you're in the market for a new car or a used car, check if it has a wet belt. My honest recommendation, avoid. Yeah. <laughs> so as always, thanks a lot for watching. I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the DVRA channel.